When anyone first loses their sight, they go through a depressive time. And the River Mersey looks very inviting. So what have we got? We've got a little boy. All of a sudden, didn't have any independence whatsoever. I wasn't in a good place at all. He was depressed because he can't go anywhere. In his own eyes, he was useless, but now he's useful because of using guide dog. It's about that bond and it's about that relationship that a man's got with his animal. Between you and that dog, it's a total partnership. He trusts you 100%, you trust him. She's everything to me, absolutely everything. You're my eyes, aren't you? There's one animal that's always been by man's side. A constant companion, protector and guide. On the end of a lead or leading the way. And for 80 years, one organisation has been turning this bond into a valuable working relationship. The Guide Dogs for the Blind Association began in 1931 on Merseyside, funny enough, not far from where I grew up. Today, the story of every guide dog begins a hundred miles away in Leamington Spa. Good morning, Guide Dog National Breeding Centre. How may I help you? Home to one of the world's most advanced dog breeding programmes. This is Georgie. She's a four-year-old golden retriever, and she's expecting. The father is a Labrador. Now, this crossbreed is ideal for future guide dogs, combining the Labrador's intelligence with the golden retriever's eagerness to please. That's a puppy there, but it's cut in half, like that way across. Georgie's scan seems to show she's carrying nine puppies. That's a little above average. Her cargo is extremely precious. Every guide dog, from cradle to grave, costs £50,000. Her waters are broke, and she's had a couple of contractions so far. One there, there. Once this one comes out, it'll be all systems go, won't it, Mrs? Each letter is assigned a letter of the alphabet. Georgie's pups' names will all begin with the letter K. And we're off. Now, I must warn you here, if you're eating your tea, turn away. The first pup weighs 340 grams. Now that's three quarters of a pound to you and me. And she's going to be given the name Kylie. Good girl. Good girl. So we've got Kira, Kirby, Corky, Keith, Kerry. Coco, Cola, and Clodo. That makes nine. Uh, uh, hang on a minute. I do think we've got another one. I reckon. Fear here. And there. Uh, that's a big one. Contracted, and I think I can feel a leg. <laughs> hey, up, here's number 11. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> Where's that come from? <laughs> With a grand total of 12 puppies, Georgie's work is finally done. The puppies can't hear yet, in fact, they're blind themselves. But in just seven weeks' time, They'll undergo a puppy profiling assessment to see whether they've got what it takes to become guide dogs. Modern guide dog movement began really as a result of 
um, blinded soldiers from the First World War, usually from um, poisonous gas. Um, and the German doctor that was working with a, a particular group of, of blinded war veterans noticed that the German shepherd that he'd left with a particular um, soldier showed some sort of aptitude in terms of guiding that individual. And from that, um, developed the notion that, that dogs could be used as guides for, for people that were blind or partially sighted. There are almost 5,000 guide dogs working in the UK and around 1,000 members of staff. Oh, what have you got? Ruth Graham is a mobility instructor with the Liverpool team and it's her job to match the right dogs to the right owners. Today, she's bringing Chelsea for a first date with former cabbie David. Hi David, Hello. how are you? It's Ruth from Guide Dogs. Hello Chelsea. Hi. Hi, I've brought Thank Chelsea along. Come on. Come on. Okay. Where do you like to sit usually, David? Yeah. Oh, lovely. But I was chatting to a colleague of mine and we decided that actually Chelsea might suit you. Um, she'd had a little walk with some people on Monday but they didn't suit her so we felt that maybe you should have a little walk with Chelsea just around your local block and have a little feel and see how you get on with Chelsea. Yeah. I've been on the waiting list now for two years. They did bring one down, but it didn't work out. I applied for it then because uh, my eyes became that bad. Um, and I became not confident going out, couldn't do anything. You just more or less rely on other people. I don't want to rely on other people. I'm insulin dependent diabetic. I've got nerve damage going throughout my body through the diabetes. I'd always have problems with my sight up at daytime. I'd always get headaches, pains by the back of the eye. Uh, so constantly I was a night animal. When I went to work, it was permanent nights or in the dark. I can't see nothing at my right eye. What I do see it is light and movement, shadows but I can't visualise what's in front. I mean, I still walk into lampposts, <laughs> you know. When anyone first loses their sight, they go through a depressive time, and the River Mersey looks very inviting. And for me, that came very close at one time. So just start telling us straight to the curb, lovely. But having something like a guide dog with you, it will enable me now to get back to the community and do the things I, I haven't been able to do. That was brilliant, wasn't that was it? good, eh? yeah. Took me straight home as well. She did take you straight oh. home. She remembered where she was going. Oh, That's it, well done. I think there's a lot of potential for you to go forward. What do you think? Do you need time to think about it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. no. Oh, no. Oh, Is good. it all right with good. you? Hey, it's all right with you, girl. Can you take a photograph? Oh, yeah. It was a very successful first meet, actually. The dog, the dog and the client took to each other very well. Yeah, it makes you feel good. You know, you can take that feeling for granted sometimes when you do, you've done the dog for so long, but to be honest, it's a really good feeling when you, when you get the right dog and the right handler, you know, it's a good job done. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> this is just the beginning of a very long process that requires hard work and training for David. Liverpool is one of 20 centres nationwide where young guide dogs like Chelsea are trained intensively. It's like the dogs come to school and you drop them off at nine and you pick them up at five and you have them at the weekends. It's where one-year-old dogs do their basic training. Learning road sense, how to avoid obstacles and how to respond to the handlers. Stop. No. This is the crucial age when, through positive reinforcement and constant correction, they learn to become guide dogs. Once they've mastered the basics, they need to be matched to the right owner. Now this takes some doing. Factors like height, weight and stride come into it, but personality matters most of all. <laughs> 24-year-old Lynette Proctor lives in Wallasey. This is James P. Sullivan, Sully for short. He's my little best friend at the moment. <laughs> I can't walk him anymore. I took him for a walk last year and felt that I couldn't look after myself. How could I look after him? 
and I love him too much to put him at any risk. I was born with nystagmus, which is a condition to do with your optic nerve, which means your eyes shake from side to side. I've also got ocular albinism, which that's linked in, which is why I'm so blonde and so pale. <laughs> but I had surgery when I was three, and it made me be able to cope normally. I used to sit in front of the telly about a couple of centimetres away from it, which my mum and dad do think they got used to having my head as a silhouette in front of the TV. But although I was registered partially sighted, I coped fine. I went to mainstream school, I was head girl, I got top GCSE results, I did well in my A-levels, I got my first uni place that I wanted. And then all of a sudden my vision deteriorated, at which point uh, it was a totally new, different um, ballpark, which was not fun. Lynette was forced to leave university and return home. All of a sudden didn't have any independence whatsoever. I was only able to go out with my mum. I was having to take, have, take her with me when I went over to Liverpool to meet my friends. I wasn't in a good place at all. I think I wanted to be normal. And t I know people say that normal doesn't exist, but when you're 21, you don't want to have to worry about losing your sight. You don't want to have to worry about what am I going to do, what am I going to do for work, how am I going to cope with uni, what, how do I tell my friends, how, do you, how am I going to get somewhere. You don't, you don't want to have to worry about any of those things. You want to just live. Lynette's been waiting for a guide dog for two years. Every time the phone rang for the last months and months and months, I've expected it maybe. Even if I'm in the house on my own, I'll answer it just in case it was them ringing to say they'd found me a dog. And every time it wasn't, ever. <laughs> Finally, the long-awaited day has come. Ruth has brought Pippa to meet Lynette, a dog that Ruth had previously tried to match with David. Pippa is quite a fast dog and she's quite active, so Pippa didn't suit David. Sometimes that what looks good on paper doesn't actually match in reality and that's the whole purpose of a matching visit, to make sure the potential that's on paper actually is there physically in real life when you have a go. Good. Hi Lynette, you alright? How are you doing? I brought Pippa along for a little visit. Should we come in? Let's count down to how many sleeps till Pippa arrives. <laughs> We've been waiting that long because I've waited for months and months and months, so I'm really excited. If this first date goes well, Pippa could call this home for the rest of her working life. Good girl, straight on. The vision that I do have, because it paces, it moves from side to side, I can't focus on anything. I'm all right if I'm sat down still and I can start to look in on things, but as soon as I get outside moving around, and yeah, I can't cope. OK, Lynette, how was that? Freezing. Freezing. <laughs> I tried not to get too excited because I didn't want to... If it didn't work out, I didn't want it to be, to be upset. So I, I tried to tried not to get too attached to her, but I couldn't help but, like, uh, I certainly feel she's got a lot of potential for you yeah. uh, um, to carry on with the training. You just have to give her back. <laughs> you do have to give her back today, but you've done really well, Lynette. Well done. I'd like to be able to be seeing my friends when I want to see them, not having to rely on people, being able to just enjoy people's company rather than having to ask for help all the time. And hopefully Pippa's going to be able to give me that. It's two and a half weeks since Georgie gave birth to 12 potential guide dogs and the pup's eyes and ears are beginning to open. Today they're being weaned. Let's see how they get on with solid food. They're very cute at this age. Best age, two to three weeks. Hmm? <laughs> I keep spitting it out. This one's Kylie. <laughs> she doesn't like her food, though. <laughs> this one doesn't want to eat. Whereas this, this, this one, one wants to eat everything. That's nice. This one loves it. You know the big food. But someone's missing. There's 11 pups now. We lost one within the first 24 hours of them being born. It's a little girl, Coco. Some pups just fade in that first few hours. Um, we send all our pups off for post-mortem to see if there is anything untoward, but we haven't heard anything about this one yet. 
But as you can see, the rest are doing really, really well. Yeah. Developing well, starting to wean. Today, the puppies have a visitor. Their proud dad. What is it? What is it, look? Look at this. Eight-year-old Kane is known as a bit of a stud around the kennels. Over the years, he's fathered 162 quality pups. His offspring have a higher than normal chance of qualifying as guide dogs. A vital part of the breeding program is the sperm bank held in this cryogenic lab. A varied stock of bloodlines is essential to create the healthiest dogs. Usually, Kane's here to meet one of his many girlfriends, but um, that's not what's planned for today. So, Kane is um, excited because he associates seeing me as having a mating. Most of the time when he comes in, that means he's got a girlfriend and he's going to perform a mating for us. He is going to be a little bit disappointed. Kane is such a good stud dog that we've used lots of his semen for exports. So we sent his samples around the world to use in different guide dog schools. Um, because he's been collected from there for several times, at the minute he's not very comfortable with it being done. He gets a little bit cross about it. He's not very keen on it at all. <laughs> but he has to occasionally, obviously. But I, I don't really know anything about how they do it. No, neither do I. Uh, uh, Alice? What you'll see is he'll start to fidget. He'll be going like this and he'll start going... <laughs> because he's going, get off my willy, basically. He's such a laid-back dog and he's willing to learn, even at his age. He's nearly nine, so it's not as though he's a young dog. So he's doing very well. Yeah. I'm not doing it, are you? Sorry. No good. Today, this old dog is having none of it. I think he prefers a natural mating, so I don't want to take the sample today if he's not 100% to give it. So I'll wait till he's got a girlfriend. And they're not so afraid. Oh, bad luck, Alice. Never, yeah, never mind. mind. Never Thanks for bringing it in. Oh, it's a pleasure. All right. Yes, thank you very much. Oh. Never mind. Maybe Kane will get lucky next time. While Kane's a bit of a serial dater, some dogs are interested in more lasting relationships. This young man's name here, this is Rod. Now, he's two and a half years old. He's a cross Labrador retriever. I don't know if a dog can have a sense of humour, but I think he has, because he's absolutely wonderful. He's got a very laid-back nature. He doesn't really care where the night falls at all. Last year, Mark and Rod were paired up and underwent residential training together. But Mark soon found Rod's attention wasn't entirely focused on him. In the evening, they said, we'll, um, you know, we'll meet up, owners and dogs, for the first time, just, you know, just, uh, just to get to know everybody. So uh, we met up, and uh, my dog seemed to take a very strong attraction to another dog that was there. And vice versa, this other dog was getting very interested in, in mine. Over the course of the next couple of days, I got uh, chatting to the owner of this dog, who was uh, a lady called Claire. This person is Venice, my guide dog. She's everything to me, actually. Aren't you, eh? Absolutely everything. You're my eyes, aren't you? Rod and Venice met on the 10-day residential training programme last year. <laughs> it's a course that every new guide dog owner has to undergo. There were five dogs on the course. The other three never got a look in. It was always Rod and Venice. She'd see Rod and she would pull to go towards him and he would pull to go towards her. And actually the trainers did say, oh, it's the love story of the course. <laughs> During our little talks, we found that uh, we lived about a mile and a half away from one another and had done for absolutely ages. They got on so well, the dogs, that we decided we'd swap numbers and we'd meet up for coffee after we'd both finished training. After the end of the course, we met up, and of course, as soon as these pairs saw one another, they were going absolutely crazy. It was nice to talk to somebody 
who is actually going through the same experiences as you were, you know. And um, the coffee led to lunches which lasted three hours and eventually in the July we ended up going for a curry without the dogs. That's when I thought, oh, he's a nice fella. <laughs> Without the sight, even just meeting a relationship doesn't exist because you can't pick up on any facial expressions, no eye expressions, nothing like that. So even going out at night on your own is going to be a no-no because you're not going to go out without the dog and you certainly aren't going to take the dog into a nightclub. One year on, Mark has brought Claire to the restaurant where they had their first date and it just so happens to be Valentine's Day. Me with your little hand. Mm, me with your little hand, yes. Claire, my sweetheart, my darling. What? Will you do me the honour of being my wife? Is that what I think it is? Mm. I will marry you. One proviso. What's that? Don't ever change. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I didn't expect to get a guide dog and uh, end up with a fiance. <laughs> I don't know if it was something guiding us, I really don't know. Um, I don't know whether the word soulmate comes into it, I really don't know, but I'm, I never did believe anything like that. But I'm seriously starting to know. In Liverpool, David and Lynette have checked into a local hotel for the next 10 days to do their residential training. We're here for a 10 day period. We've got a lot to do. We've got, you know, we've got a lot to get through over the next 10 days, okay? Mm. You're all going to say you're all here to learn the same thing. Yes. And we appreciate that everybody has got, you know, different learning styles, you know, and Ruth and I have got different sorts of training methods as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll be doing different things each day. The dogs have already undergone intensive training. Now it's the turn of the new owners to learn to drive them. From walking to emergency stops, grooming to three-point turns, it's intense and repetitive and very demanding. When I left school, I couldn't read and write. Early hours of the morning, milk flow when it was fairly early dark. I used to go out on the milk and I learned to count using milk bottles. Uh, and I started from there to learn to read and write, but it was all Scouse. It wasn't English, so it was completely wrong. All right, lovely. Good girl, that's better. Good, well done. Lennart is the only client I've, I've been working with who makes this job glamorous. <laughs> she really is. She, makes, she puts the glamour into guide dog work. Not every guide dog is a Labrador or Golden Retriever. Ready? Foster, I will always say that he is the Ferrari of guide dogs. A little Labrador bitch might be your little Renault or your, or your Clio, if you like it, that does the work for you, and there's nothing wrong with that. Good boy, Fost. You know, I've got friends who've got Labradors, they love them to bits, so it is about personal choice. Stephen Foster live in Warwickshire with his daughter, Megan, and his partner, Sarah. Foster's definitely the favourite. He'd do anything for Dad. I mean, he's even followed him to, into the shower once. He's that besotted with Dad. He's a bit of a crazy dude, Foster is. He's, he's wonderful. I love him. The partnership's been brilliant right from the start. They just immediately clicked, didn't you? Yeah. He's... Mm. Foster really is me. Mm. He's fast, he's positive, he's mischievous. I couldn't have a dog that hasn't got that level of energy because it would just drive me nuts. I always get the job of peeling the onions. It's because I've got two artificial eyes, my eyes don't actually run when I'm peeling them. <laughs> when I finished off at school, my ambition was that I wanted to do a business diploma. But the school told me the only thing that I was really fit for was making baskets, weaving, tuning pianos, and if that didn't work out for me, I could always sell boxes of matches on the street corner. Steve, however, had other ideas.
dream I had was driving fast cars. In 1999, Steve became the fastest blind person in the world, reaching a speed of 176 miles per hour. A lot of my life, people have made decisions for me on my blindness. But the decisions they've actually made were more a reflection of themselves and them saying to themselves, well, if I was blind, I wouldn't be able to do the things that Steve wants to do. Somebody said to me only the other day, they said, what's it like to drive a car when you can't see, Steve? I said, well, I could have seen, I wouldn't have done it. It's the navigator's job to guide Steve around the track. Just going there, that's it, back on the car now. Just as it's Foster's job to guide him round the streets. A blind person's life is built around trust and it's built around communication. Whether I be out in the street with Foster or whether I be driving a racing car, it's all about converting the information that you're being given into a process. My greatest strength is the passion and the belief and the confidence I have. How's that? <laughs> Good. And I've got a dog that supports that. You know, if I wasn't like that, maybe I would be a Ford Fiesta man and a Labrador, but I'm not. In Liverpool, David and Lynette are halfway through their guide dog training. Streets. Good girl. I'm just shocked at how much it's like made made me feel walk, confident walking already, and it's only six days in. Good girl, steady. Straight away, I felt um, relaxed with her, but now when I'm walking, I, I trust her that she's gonna look after me more. Straight to the cab. She's doing a better job than my mum already. So <laughs> my mum regularly walks me into things or forgets she's with me or walks into me herself. Good girl. But how are things going for David? Lovely and steady. Nice and close to your handle. It is quite tiring. It's just so much to do and I, I don't think we've even got halfway. Tell her to leave it. She's having a little sniff. There's so much to learn. I didn't think it would be this hard. If she stops, I want you to stop with her. Yeah. Good girl to stop. Okay. okay. So she's actually getting a reward for what she's doing. I'm used to going around with a cane and I've got to retrain myself to do without my cane now and trust in Chelsea. She's a highly trained dog, I'm not. I'm an idiot. <laughs> and David has other problems. His daughter has had to move into his house, bringing a pet dog with her. It's a Staffordshire Bull Terrier and she can be a little bit sort of aggressive towards dogs and if, if, if Chelsea is sort of, you know, if, has any sort of attack on her that will absolutely destroy the training because she's, you know, she's so sensitive towards other dogs and if, if a dog has a pop on her, it could absolutely stop her from being a guide dog. So I'm steady and stand. Done. Because David's been a bit uptight about the situation, it's, it's kind of impacted on how he's walking with Chelsea. And Chelsea's been feeling the pressure. They do pick up on our sort of emotions in that, you know, if we get tense, that will transmit through to the harness to the dogs, and then they, they worry that something's different and something's wrong, you know. I don't, you know, they don't understand the concept of emotions, but they do recognise when, when we're uptight, and if we're uptight, they, they pick up on that, so... There's been a, a slight hiccup with a family member. I know this may sound hard, but it's not about them, it's about me and Chelsea. You know, it's about my life, what I've got left, about what Chelsea can do to me over the next ten years. And if I need that independence and I need companionship, it's me and Chelsea. You know, everything else is secondary. That's the way I'm looking at it now. Today, the puppies have a PR job to do. A photo shoot with Mr International Great Britain. Kylie's taking a bit of a shine to him. That middle one. Oh, I think we're fine as well, yeah. Every year, 1,300 puppies are born under the breeding programme, and around 850 will qualify as guide dogs. But what happens to the hundreds of dogs who don't make the grade? The answer lies with our puppy's big sister.
Every family's got one. The black sheep that ends up in the nick. Banged up in Her Majesty's prison, Lay Hill, is another of Stud Dog Kane's offspring. This is Pepper, the infamous Pepper. Pepper failed her guide dog training for being easily distracted and far more keen on following her nose than following instructions. But the good news is, she's found a job which makes use of her failings. She's being trained as a prison sniffer dog. You got the gram of heroin, please? Here we go, Pepper. 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 She's got that natural bit of naughtiness in her. You know, she likes to work and she enjoys the game, as you can see. But it is trying to totally turn things round that the guide dogs spend 18 months doing and we come along and ruin it, really, with a within a month to, to what we want out of a dog. Oh, steady, 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 steady. It's what they want to do. It's, they are retrieving dogs at the end of the day. They are gun dogs that like, like to go out. And that's what they're doing now. They're going out, searching for us, identifying something and retrieving. Guide dogs have a, have a lovely, lovely life. You know, they live in somebody's house and they get treated very well. So there's plus sides on both. But I think for the natural ability of letting the dog's brain work, I would say that they enjoy this work more than guiding. Sorry, guide dogs. <laughs> 22-year-old Mohammed Katri from Leicester is studying for a master's in philosophy. He's had his guide dog, Vargo, for five years. I had sight until I was about 15, 16, when from the age of eight, I've had numerous retinal detachments and I eventually lost my sight six years ago. Needless to say, I was pretty depressed. I was pretty down because everything you thought I could have done, I couldn't do anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't just jump on a computer and use it. I couldn't play computer games. I couldn't use a mobile phone anymore. I couldn't even walk from my house across the road to my friend's house without any help. And that's quite a big shock. The logical step for Mohammed was to get a guide dog, but that brought with it certain problems. No one who's Asian really has a dog. No one who's Asian really has any form of pet. So when I got Vargo, it was quite a shock. And then when I got him, I was scared for a week or two. And then eventually you realise, hang on, this is silly. How, how can I be scared of something that's looking after me? Eventually that fear overcomes you and you start to bond better with, with your... With your to guide dog with Vargo. If Vargo's arrival was frightening for Mohammed, it was even more so for his mum, Shabnam. You know, when the first time the guide dog people came and they brought the Vargo, they brought the Vargo and straight away they, they just took him to my big lounge. It was, it was a Friday this time and, you know, I was really upset. I fall into tears, I went in the kitchen and I said, oh my God, you know, I'm gonna have a do dog in the house how I'm gonna deal with it. And like, Mama goes, oh, Mom, look, if it really upsets you, you know, I won't have the dog. I said, look, son, give me some time. I will, you know, slowly, slowly, as the time goes. And when the once a while came, I think we were fine. First, first for a few, I think, few weeks, I was really upset and really scared. And, I do not want to go near Wago. I don't want Wago to come to me or touch me. But now it's fine, absolutely fine. Now, you know, he's part of our family. So it's really nice having him. Another one? Ooh. The Catri family grew to accept Vargo, but there was still a major hurdle. A guide dog made it difficult for Mohammed to practice his Muslim faith. The problem lies with, with their saliva. A dog as a pet would be unacceptable because their saliva is left everywhere and it, it makes an area unclean. Islamic beliefs relating to dogs meant Mohammed couldn't attend prayers without help from a sighted guide. After consultation with Islamic scholars, a legal decree, or fatwa, was issued which made Vargo the first dog allowed to enter a British mosque. In Islamic world, uh, you know, the, the dog is not allowed but if somebody needed for his uh, security or some other things which is uh, like uh, disability, then Islam said yes, it was uh, okay. 
They let us build a little pen in the main entrance of the mosque so I can take him, put him into his pen. He's got his own bed there, a little bowl, a little toy. I can go observe my prayers and then come back and vlog is waiting for me. It means I don't have to rely on someone taking me to the mosque. And I also don't have to be handicapped just because I have a dog. He was depressed because he can't go anywhere. And he was maybe in, in his own eyes, he was useless. But now he's useful because of using guide dog. Losing your sight. You want some sort, some form of inner peace. You want some form of happiness. I'm not saying I'm the most religious person in the world, but I would say that it certainly does help me, help me cope. So I must be really, really thankful to the mosque where they back me up in every situation. It's the final day of the Liverpool team's training course. It was a case of try and throw everything in and hope that maybe it will all close eventually. Even if you sit on it, I'm not so sure it's going to actually all fit in. I've enjoyed having her, but I think I liked, I, I would like to get home and have my own space. It's hard when you're stuck in somewhere you don't know. Normally, if you've been out for the day, you just go home and relax and you know where everything is. Like, my house, apart from when I moved away, I've lived in that house for nearly 25 years, so I know exactly where everything is. I'd like to say thank you very much for attending the course. I really appreciate your, your, the time you've put in and, and everything you know that you've been through this last 10 days. Now we're going to take the dog out of their comfort zone back into your home, into your home. Among the successful pairings, there's one on hold. David has left Chelsea and dropped out of the course. He's got personal circumstances that he needs to resolve and sort out and then we'll go back into the situation and, and go from there. It can happen because obviously it's like anybody in any learning situation, you can go to university, you can go on a course, anything can happen but like, if something happens in your personal life, sometimes you have to, that's a priority in your, in your life isn't it, so you have to put things aside. At the Guide Dogs National Breeding Centre, Kane and Georgie's litter are being prepared for modern life. We have CDs that we play at a relatively low background noise, like lawn mowers, um, aeroplanes, trains, but whilst the pups are having an enjoyable experience, so they'll have a positive association once they get used to them. Now seven weeks old, they'll face the test, which will decide if they're suitable to be trained as guide dogs or not. The puppy profiling assessment is a series of games and exercises designed to identify character traits which could make them unsuitable Hello. for guiding work. Hey Kylie. There we go. Right? Have fun. <laughs> We're looking for a variety of traits that, that are really important for, for guide dog work and that's of course confidence. They need to be confident. They need to be responsive to the handler, so we expect them to be aware of the environment, but, um, but not over-aware and not too distracted. Good boy. Very impressive. That was nice. Yeah. yeah. And they need to be compliant. They need to generally be able to be um, with the handler, um, happy to do as the handler says, affable, friendly, all those sorts of things. So th those are the sort of traits that we're looking at and that we think that we can see even at a very early age of seven weeks. This is the squirrel test which measures how easily distracted they are. Good boy! Come on! While the tunnel boy. walk shows their confidence. <laughs> oh, no! What was that? So how have our puppies got on? They've done really well. They seem very relaxed, pretty responsive, um, which is great, of course, and pretty confident, too. They seem to be taking on each, each of the challenges really well. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's a good boy. The good news is all 11 puppies have made the grade. Each one of them will now be placed with volunteer families for the first year of their life, after which they'll begin their guide dog training in earnest. David's back home without Chelsea. 
and once more having to rely on his cane to get around. I come under some stress while I was training. Henry! Henry! Come on, son. There were two big problems. One of the problems was my daughter. She has a dog. Uh, the dogs must be put together to make sure that it's safe. Unfortunately, that had not been done with Chelsea Henry. and my daughter's dog. Henry! So that had to be sorted out. The other thing that caused a problem was a uh, breakup with my girlfriend. So the two combined at the same time sort of knocked me right back. And the third thing was not having Chelsea. And it was like something being torn out of you, you know what I mean? You could actually feel it was really a heartache. I've come this far, I've got attached to her, we just bonded and she's gone. It's a month since Lynette and Pippa finished training and the first time in two years that Lynette's been in public on her own. A hard-earned victory. I think I wanted to sleep for about a month afterwards. It's been worth it though, so it's been worth being tired and exhausted constantly because now having her I wouldn't I wouldn't change it. How can this crazy little dog who's all hyperactive all the time when she's on her harness how can she manage to help me get out for the first time in two years on my own? This was quite strange. <laughs> Lynette has finally gone back to her job at a health centre. Not that anyone's paying her much attention. She's in a prime position here for everybody who walks up the stairs, so everyone's like, oh, it's a dog. But she's, as you can tell, she's not fazed by any of it. A little darling just stays underneath the chair and doesn't even know she's there. She's beautiful. At home, there's one person who's especially pleased with Pippa's new job. Lynette's former guide. Already in the few weeks that she's had her, I'm actually redundant and I'm proud of the fact. I'm really pleased. She's back to the old Lynette, the one that um, could take on the world and I think she will. I think she'll do herself proud. Comparing what things were like before her to now, it's even more of a bigger change than I thought it would be. It may have took two years, but we're happy now. <laughs> and it looks like David might get a chance at happiness too. His daughter has moved out, taking her dog with her. With that danger gone, he's been having one-on-one -on -one training sessions with Chelsea at home. Ruth and the other trainers came down and we had words and we had talks and uh, they put me at ease and stuff and then we, I was reintroduced back to to Chelsea when everything was sorted out. You can't describe the feeling. It was so exciting, you know, because up until then, until I saw it, I actually didn't believe people. Based on their performance today, Ruth will finally decide whether David and Chelsea have a future together. Straight on, Chelsea. There's a good girl. Over the last couple of weeks, David, you worked really hard and good you've been girl. really supporting Chelsea nicely. And the lovely thing is you work together well as a unit. You look very together. Good so with that in girl. mind, David, how would you feel if we signed you up today and qualified you after that walk? Because you've done very well. How would you feel about that? Pen. Yeah? Pen. Ready to sign on the Pen. dotted line? I could have lost Chelsea Goodness knows what happened. Could have lost my daughter, I could have lost... Well, I did lose my girlfriend, but, you know, uh, in a way, it's made me stronger because me and Chelsea now, um, well, we're partners, if you know what I mean. I spoiled it Well done. Congratulations, you. you worked really hard. Thanks very well much. Well, I'm happy now. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I'm more happy with her than my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, Paul's back in Battersea tomorrow night, hoping to find a new home for a nine-year-old Doberman. For the love of dogs, tomorrow night at 8.30. Next relationship counselling's on the cards for Paulian and Ken. Could this get them back on track? Love and marriage, coming up.